episode of The Dog Show features Nathan Williams. Nathan is Australia's leading expert in dog psychology and behavioural issues. He's regularly featured in the media to discuss all topics related to dog behaviour, donates his time working with problematic dogs in animal shelters, and works tirelessly to dispel myths surrounding so-called vicious breeds, such as pit bulls and bull mastiffs. In the interview, we discuss the psychology behind dog behavior problems and how you can overcome them. Nathan, welcome to The Dog Show today. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm looking forward to having a chat today. You've got an extensive history in dog psychology and and dog training, so I'm really excited to hear some insights about what we're talking about today. But do you want to kick things off by just telling me how it all happened? Why did you become a dog trainer in the first place? Uh, I became... Uh, a dog behavior specialist kind of through necessity um, because the world uh, right now as we see it has is, is kind of more confused than ever when it comes to dogs but we're meant to kind of be evolving so when people at home are trying to do the right thing it's like the more they're trying to do the right thing the the more wrong they're getting it um, and that's what I've found throughout the, the term of the work I've been doing is that people are struggling more they try. So it basically taught me from the very beginning that there's a there's a, a problem in the teachings itself, not in the owner itself. Because the, the, the term is there's no such thing as a bad dog, there's only a bad owner, which is couldn't be further from the truth. Okay. Never met a bad owner. I've met a thousand of owners who are trying to do the right thing, but they just don't know how to, mm. right? Um, but they've had three trainers out there trying to teach them, you know, and the rule is what works for one dog might not work for another dog. Um, but then there's rules and these rules exist, that work with all dogs. And, and it's kind of like kids, like kids have different needs, but if you get them to follow the same kind of rules and you work out how to accomplish that, then they're all good. So at the beginning, I felt like I had no choice but to do it because if I don't do it, um, especially at the beginning, uh, there was dogs being euthanized for these behavioral problems. And knowing what I know and not doing it, I wouldn't be able to live with myself. So I kind of had no choice but to, to help. So now I'm kind of motivated by multiple things, but one of them is necessity. Mm. The other one's an easy one, is love and passion. You know, the love of dogs and being able to help people as well because a lot of people get into this industry because they don't like people. Mm. They love dogs. But that's probably where I'm very different because I love people, especially dog people. Mm. You know, so this is kind of like a, a people industry with dogs in it. Yeah, well, you got to be – I mean, you're dealing with the owners, right? So <laughs> you gotta, you got to be a people person yeah, as absolutely. well. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's. I mean, there's. Unfortunately, there's so many dogs that are euthanized globally, um, even today, even with all of the the education pieces that are out there. So it's it's a it's a great cause to be looking after. Absolutely. Um, so I, I believe you had a part of your journey was you had a, a pit bull mix or something at one point that had some behavioural issues. Is that right? And that kind of spurred you on. Well, yeah, I um I I used to work with horses uh, when I was a lot younger and. Um, I had a, an, it was, it was a pit bull. It was, it wasn't, uh, he was a pure pit bull. Okay. Yep. Um, and he ended up suffering from uh, separation anxiety and just, just like quite intense anxiety to the point where he was hurting himself to try and escape, to try and get to me if I wasn't home. Um, realizing what I was doing with him was nearly the opposite to what I was doing with horses. And then as soon as I realized that, I started interacting with him in a very different way. And in three days, he made a complete turnaround. And then I just saw something that seemed blatantly obvious to me um, that no one seems to see. So then I've kind of learned about that more and honed those skills and knowledge over the last 18 years to get to the point I'm at now where we can help uh, any dog. So any dog, no matter how aggressive, no matter how anxious, there's always a way. It's just knowing the way to do it. Because I keep hearing that that dog can't be helped. And all I actually hear is they don't know how to do it. Hmm. So, But I prove every day that if you know how to, you can accomplish it. 
and we're starting to video that too so we're going to be releasing some evidence of that very shortly okay before it's you kind of stepping around how that actually happens but before i i kind of probe you about that why don't yep. why don't we take a step back and talk about the impl- implications of behavioral problems so we're kind of talking about dog behavior problems and what are the implications for owners like how does that how does it come to fruition for an owner when it when a dog's oh, got a behavioral issue man it's, it's for people that don't go through it it's nearly impossible to understand it because mm-hmm. it, it's it can be really severe i've had people that have that have taken months off work because they're so afraid to leave their dog because the dog's harming itself um i've got people that have that are, are afraid to have people uh visit them um they're afraid to walk their dog uh, of their dog attacking somebody, um, and and these people and dogs they're all innocent. You know, it's not like they're mistreating their dog and it's caused this problem. It's like they're the only thing they're guilty of is loving their dog and not knowing what to do. Hmm. And then the dog gets caught in that and is just massively confused and just getting all the wrong information and just more confusion as as time goes on. But then where I'm lucky, I get the chance to kind of get in there and kind of neaten everything and simplify it for the owner and tidy everything up and have the dog like just intensely loved, controlled and, and calmed. Yeah, it's um, so, but for, from the owner's perspective, the stuff they go through, sleepless nights and being attacked by their own dog and worried about the dog attacking and just worried about the dog all day when they're at work and uh, and uh, this can go on for years i've had clients that have dealt with stuff like this with one dog for 12 years yeah. you know and then come in and get sorted out that day and they're like oh if i knew about this 12 years ago yeah. so you can try and imagine what it looks like from that person's perspective that they went through 12 years of stress and drama and even trauma and then finding out they could have fixed it 12 years ago, had they known. Yeah, well, I mean, a dog's meant to bring joy to your life, right? Um, yeah. And you're meant to bring joy, yeah, joy to a dog's life. And that's kind of the situation you're explaining is like the opposite of that. So no one wants to be, no one yeah, wants absolutely. to be in that situation. Um, yeah. like, a lot of people think that because they've had a good dog, they think that what they did created that. Hmm. But most people, they've got a good dog just out of chance because... It's kind of like a classroom full of kids. You could have 30 kids in there, but if you could go in and go, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I want to teach two of those kids. You know, you could go in there and watch them and go, well, those two look super easy. I'm gonna pick those two, um, and then working with them, you could be, oh, these are so easy. Hmm. But that's not the work I do. I go in there and pick the worst two, <laughs> and and work with those. So a lot of people accidentally get the good two. Hmm. You know. But the unfortunates, they, and sometimes I say it's a blessing in a really good disguise because sometimes it becomes a beautiful thing, you know, like I, I get people that have, the kind of shut down in life in general. They, they, they don't stand up for themselves. They let everyone bully them and they got this dog that's kind of pushing them around. And through the teachings, I get them to kind of step up and make things happen and it starts to change the person's attitude. Mm. And they end up telling me it changes the way they live their life. You know, they start to function a bit differently. And um, turns out they needed that dog. They needed that experience um, for, for them in their lives to kind of progress. And mm. because they, a lot of people kind of get stuck. And sometimes problems like this, hidden really well, can kind of get you out of a rut. And again, that's another blessing that I have that I, I get the opportunity to help people kind of get out of those ruts. I get dogs that are giving the owner anxiety when the owner's already suffering from from anxiety. We come in and do the work with the dog, and the dog's so calm. It helps the owner, like, get rid of their anxiety. So then the dog does become that what it was meant to be in the first place. Because you're right. Dogs are meant to be, like, our loving companion that brings joy and love and... Uh, if anything, more peace and stuff to our life. Mm. But unfortunately, some people don't get dealt that card. <laughs> uh, but I think it's on all of us to kind of look outside the box and go, there's got to be a better way. And that's what I'm here to teach. 
it's interesting that you pointed out the, I guess the the metaphor used was the the, the classroom with you know the two bad dogs and, and and the rest of the dogs that may just be you might naively just go into that relationship and it's a bit easier for that owner. There's actually some yep. some really amazing inspirational stories of owners adopting dogs from shelters that have behavioral issues and going on a transformative journey with them. And so as you mentioned, it, it, it transforms the owner's life as well as the dog's life. And it's quite empowering. Because yeah. it, 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 when you get to witness it, it's such a, it's a beautiful thing to see. Mm. You know, there's, a, there's actually a documentary, uh, Champions. I don't know if you've seen that. It's about Michael Vick's dogs that um, oh, yeah. were used for dog fighting. Right. And, I can't remember how many, but it was like hundreds of dogs that were taken. They were used for dog fighting, ended up going to loving homes. And the majority of them, not again, the, not only did the dogs come good and get a loving home and like that alone is such a beautiful story. Yeah. But the people that took them in, it, 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 it changed them at the core in such a good way. And everyone that was involved in it was beautiful. So that documentary, The Champions, is worth Champions. watching. That sounds great. I'm going to look yeah. that up once we get off. Uh, yeah. Get off a call. Um, okay, so assuming most people would understand what the common behavioural problems are, like your biting, anxiety, aggression, these kind of things. Um, yep. Wh- let's let's go right back to the beginning. Wh- where do you believe that these problems? Wh- what's the root cause of these problems? Oh, this is beautiful. This is perfect because <laughs> this is what people need to know. Yeah. You know, because people are always trying to address the result of the problem, not the core. Mm. Now, so here's how it works. Dogs learn mainly one of two ways. They either learn to receive or demand, right? So if a dog's kind of laying in its bed, or actually, let me give you this analogy. An owner is at home, they've got a puppy, and they go, you know, I'm going to take two weeks off to spend with this puppy, um, this puppy's so cute, um, but I'm busy working, and I don't, I don't want you to bother me while I'm working. I just need this time. Um, <clears throat> but the puppy's kind of let to do whatever the puppy wants, right? And the puppy comes over to the owner, and the owner's like, "Not now, not now," um, and and keeps working away. And the puppy's like, "Oh," and goes and lays in his bed. The owner's like, oh, "Okay, I finished up." Now I'm going to come over and smother you with affection. Now what that looks like from the dog's perspective, if I try and tell you what to do, that didn't really work. But if I just lay in my bed, love just comes to me. That's awesome. Then they accidentally raise a relaxed dog. So what I do when I come to someone's house, I set that up so that happens deliberately Mm. and there's no confusion. But here's how it goes the other way. (laughs) And this is what mainly happens. So the owner's working away. The puppy comes over, jumps up, pat me, pat me, pat me, interact with me, love me, love me. The owner goes, oh, and picks the dog up, puts the dog on top of them, and gives the dog exactly what the dog wants. So the dog goes, okay, so the deal is to have love and affection, I have to tell you what to do. Then you'll notice that dog licks, that dog jumps up, then that dog mouths. Mm. Now when a dog, dog licks, mouths, and jumps up, the chance of them biting brain forward because it programs the brain to like control and demand and and force things to happen so when they feel overwhelmed they can then uh use that same methodology to control but it's that times 10 which means biting Mm. and that's normally where it comes from same with barking that if i'm not getting what i want i'll use different methods to get what i want because for things to work i have to tell you what to do but the dog that's receiving Someone comes to the front door, I'm ready. <laughs> and that dog just stays chilled out, you know, because that dog knows for me to have love and affection when someone comes, I just lay here and they come to me, right? Uh, a, a classic example of that would be a greyhound. A very socially intelligent dog. They pretty much just do that anyway. Hmm. They're like, why would I go over to you when I can just lay here? And that's where they're socially intelligent. Where most dogs... They kind of need more of our leadership and guidance to go, look, this is how it's meant to be. I I come and get you to do things. You don't get me to do things. I lead and guide you. I teach you. And I love you more than anything in the world kind of thing. And just this very calm, relaxed affection. Uh, but what most people do by accident is they set the dog up to fail. 
without knowing. Again, not the owner's fault. So the dog comes in, does all that. Then when the dog's going, okay, I'll tell you what to do. Okay, now I'm going to get you to do fetch. And the dog gets the ball, brings it back, gets the ball, brings it back. Now the dog becomes possessive and controlling, using its eyes, not its nose. Um, but this is where it starts to become a lot more complicated. And I don't know how deeply you want to get into the psychology of it, but <clears throat> um, I can say things that kind of freak people out, but it's the truth. So, for example, it's not my opinion that fetch is bad for dogs, right? But when I say that to most people, they're going, hey, hang on a minute. No, dogs love fetch. Well, this is the common misconception. So what happens? So let's say a golden retriever is the great example. If you go duck hunting and take a golden retriever, how would you say that dog finds the duck when it gets shot down? What does it use? Uh, it's it's scent, like it's smell, I imagine. I don't know. Yeah. 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 But it's got, see, it's fallen in reeds. So it has to use the nose. Hmm. So that's part one. So when you're doing fetch with a dog, they use their eyes. Because a piece of plastic doesn't have that smell. Now, keep in mind, a dog's brain, 60% of it is dedicated to scent. They're meant to function off smell, right? So that would be a natural... Uh, thing for a dog to do sniff it out get it and then accomplish it bring it back it's over here's the duck we're done that owner wouldn't pick that duck up and throw it again <laughs> that dog would be going hey hang on what the hell <laughs> um, so because that is what retrieving looks like and that gives a dog a sense of accomplishment it's finished I can relax now but if that's never ending it makes a dog insane so what we do, we teach a dog to use its eyes, ignore the nose, which means the brain won't work properly. Because I work with dogs every day that chase cars. Hmm. And then I get some people go, oh, that's prey drive. Well, how is a car prey? Because the dog's meant to use its nose. Hmm. And there's no cars driving around smelling like rabbits or anything. <laughs> no. Um, and the whole prey drive thing with dogs is a bit of a myth as well. Dogs haven't chased prey for a very long time. Um, they eat from a bowl. Hmm. And we're meant to teach them to be more like that and not chase stuff. Because we don't want them chasing stuff. Because you get people going, I do fetch, but my dog chases birds and my dog chases skateboards and cars and blah, blah. And I go, yeah, but you're getting the dog to chase, programming the brain to react to something it sees. And now the dog's doing just what you've trained, hmm. but you don't want it. So think, what's your training for? If they say exercise, go, cool, just walk your dog. Because if you walk your dog every day, your dog will be very healthy. you got a good diet, walk every day, healthy. A dog doesn't need to run. That's another myth. I'm like, yeah, let them have a run at the park and stuff. But you don't want to train them to react, use their mouth, be controlling, and do it again and again and again and again and again with no ending in sight. Because hmm. uh, when they do that, uh, Bristol University tested the blood and saliva of dogs doing fetch. And at different levels, they all release cortisol, and cortisol being a stress hormone, which means we look at it and we go, oh, look, they look like they're having fun. They're not. They're stressed. <laughs> but I can guarantee that any dog would love to just hang out with you, get a massage from you, because that's one of the main things I teach people to do, you know, and we're there massaging the dog, right? The dog's eyes are all heavy and they're going, Wow. I've never seen this dog so calm. And I'm going, that's because we've been massaging for the last 10 minutes. Hmm. That's going to have that effect, right? And it, it's so obvious sometimes, but we just don't see it. But there they're going, ooh, smacking the dog around the face, getting the dog to do tug of war, revving the dog up. One of my most interesting emails I received once was gold, actually. I had to, I had to read it back to the client. They said in the email, um, I get my dog to do fetch, we do tug of war, I put my dog next to my bike and we, we sprint. Um, then we go, we do fly ball, we do all these game stuff. Um, but for some reason, my dog won't relax. Hmm. <laughs> and I said, do you mind if I read that back to you? I read it back to him. And they go, oh. <laughs> and I said, what part of that trains the dog to be what you want? What part of that? You want the dog to be relaxed. What part of that teaches the dog to be relaxed? And they go, or well, nothing, it's the opposite. I go, that's exactly why you've got what you got. But again, not their fault. 
you don't see it when you're in it. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. When I explain it, it seems obvious and you can see it from the outside. But being in it, it, it's really hard. And that's why when I explain it to them, they go, oh, and they feel silly. I feel like I should have known that. I go, no, you're not meant to know. You're going off what everyone's been taught for the last hundred years. It's been saturated into us from when we were little kids. Because if I asked you, Will, if a yeah. dog wags its tail, what does it mean? Yeah, I, I, I'm assuming sometimes, actually sometimes happy, but sometimes anxious, depending on the situation. Yeah. So if I... If but all I the things you've been like, saying about fetch and stuff before, I mean, this is all this is all like truth bombs to me as well, so... <laughs> <laughs> well, that happens. I get that yeah. every day, twice a day. Yeah. Uh, so think about this. The tail, when it hangs, the muscle at the base of the tail is relaxed. But when the dog is tense, it pulls the tail up. Mm. So yeah, when a dog's stimulated, it comes up. And if it wags kind of like this, then that's not anxiety. That's stimulated and a bit tense. But when the dog, the tail is up super tense, super fast, that's overstimulated. That is anxious. Mm. So you're one of the rare people that say anxiety because nearly everyone just says happy. But you can watch videos on YouTube of dogs fighting each other. You'll see the tail's going ballistic. Mm. And they're obviously not happy. <laughs> so the only real way to tell or, or get an understanding of where a dog is at mentally is always the eyes. I work with dogs that they're going to attack and their tail's just hanging down. Mm. Or because some dogs, their tail's up over their back, they're about to attack. Meaning you can't really read a dog by its tail. Mm. The eyes always tell the truth. You'll see it in the eyes. But then you've got to be able to know how to read the eyes of a dog. Um, and I don't expect the average person to be able to know that. And that's why my aim is to teach people how to get it right in the first place. They don't have to worry about reading the eyes. They don't have to worry about biting or barking or anything like that. They'll know how to raise their dog, having everything beautiful and calm so much love and affection all the time, being able to go anywhere, do everything, and everyone just having normality. Normality is what I call it. But like I guess a lot of people call. It, um, sorry, sorry to cut you off. I guess what you're talking yeah. about though is if if every dog owner follows the best practice that you've discussed in terms of showing leadership and laying the foundations when a puppy is young. Then yep. they they'll have a you know an enjoyable experience throughout the whole life of the dog, but because of most people are a little bit, as you said, they've been they think that all of these things that we we have been taught for centuries of how to interact with dogs is just naturally and subconsciously how we do that. Um, the problems develop, and then it's kind of you retrospectively trying to fix those problems, which is where it becomes yeah. more challenging, right? Well, it's only actually been. Um... More so in just the last century. Before that, it was more natural interaction. Okay. Because um, if you look at the way people interact with horses um, and they don't talk to them and they lead them and guide them, they can control a 400-kilo animal very easily. So that kind of methodology is more what was used like over a century ago. Mm. And the last century, um, and particularly the, probably the last probably 30, 40 years is where it's really started to go south. Mm. Uh, because it's become very popular to walk a dog on a harness now. That's only the last five years. Mm. You know, like ten years ago, nearly everyone had a collar, right? And my dog aggression cases have quadrupled in the last five years. Because when a dog pulls on a harness at another dog, the body language can come across a bit threatening. The other dog's a bit confused. Now, if that dog's also on the harness, they can kind of be doing that to each other. Now, it doesn't mean you're going to get a problem but it increases the rate of the problems. Like it becomes more common. So in a dog that has maybe some kind of anxiety or predisposition or whatever, that can be enough to kick it off. If you've got a super friendly dog, on a harness it doesn't really matter. So again, it's not a rule. And this is the trick because people go, no, I know five dogs that go on harnesses and they're fine. I go, well, that's not how it works. We've got to look at where the problems are and know how to address those. I don't look at where the problems aren't and go, that must be the reasoning. I look at where the problems are, know how to fix those, mm. and go, that's the reasoning, that's the truth we're working with. And that's the trick. 
because unfortunately most dog trainers work with good dogs they get the two good ones in the classroom mm. you know they teach them tricks and then they think the sit the drop the stay is the reason that dog's behaving well go, no you just still got a good dog hasn't changed it just does tricks now it hasn't changed behavior hasn't changed attitude um and that's part of the problem is that the the world of dog training has gotten kind of more intense and stronger they call it positive reinforcement and that's just not true i've never seen anyone do positive reinforcement with a dog properly mm. positive reinforcement what it really looks like is when you accomplish something you get a dog to do it without a bribe right the motivation is because you're making it happen because you're leading and guiding the dog purely mm. right and then once it's accomplished, then something nice after, unexpected. Unexpected. But if you build the expectation at the beginning and show that treat as motivation, that's now a bribe. You can't have a reward and a bribe. It's got to be one or the other. You can't have positive reinforcement because that's after. Right? So you can only have either bribery or positive reinforcement. Because people ask me, do you use the method of positive reinforcement? I go, yes, but probably not the way you're thinking. Mm. <laughs> because the way people think are the way it's being taught, not the way it is when you look at psychology. So psychology in humans and dogs is the same. Positive reinforcement is something that comes after unexpected. Okay. Right? But if it's the motivation that's pushed from front, that's bribery. Right? Because... If you're going to be doing something because it's your job and you do really well at it and you get something unexpected after, well, that's rewarding. But if you're doing it for the reward, then your motivation is that, not your purpose. Because a dog's meant to comply because the dog believes in you, trusts you, has faith in you, mm. and is led and guided by you, and good things come. A dog can't think... Well, because I did that sit, therefore I'm a good boy, and that's the reason you're giving me that food. A dog never sees it that way. Dogs are very simple. I was like, I see that food in your hand. I want that. How am I going to get it? And they put their bum on the ground. They go, oh, is that it? And you go, yep, there you go. They go, oh, okay. So then they'll put their bum on the ground without you even saying anything as soon as they see food, hmm. which means really that dog hasn't learned to sit because you made it happen. That dog's learned to sit in a, in a work out a way to manipulate you to get food off you. So now the dog loses respect because the dog knows how to manipulate you to get what it wants. Again, that's a dog telling you what to do. Mm, the demanding, as you mentioned earlier, yeah. Correct. Yeah. But it's manipulative, so it doesn't seem as bad. And it looks good because we've been taught if a dog sits, they're a good boy or girl. Um. But the whole idea is, like, I wouldn't even teach sit. You know, I get people all the time saying, oh, yeah, I, I taught my dog to sit. And I'm like, well, you didn't. <laughs> and they go, yeah, I spent, like, two months on and off teaching sit. I did it. <laughs> yeah. And I go, do you mean to tell me that before you did that, the dog had no idea how to sit? They go, oh, no, when you put it like that. And I go, yeah, I'm putting it logically and factually. Mm. I'm not trying to tease you. I'm trying to point out the fact that the dog always knew how to sit and there's no reason in you doing it. Mm. And she goes, but what about when you cross the road? Just stop. The dog should stop when you stop because you're leading. The dog should walk when you walk and there shouldn't be any tension in the leash. And I teach people how to accomplish that in about 20 minutes. Mm. right? And the dog will be like that for the rest of its life because when the dog knows how to follow, it's very comfortable for them. Like, it's it's... Rewarding is probably not the right word. It's kind of like their place. They, they feel really at home. They love being guided and led, but not with force. Mm. You know, so the idea of what I do takes all the force out of it. I never hold a leash with any more than my fingertips. Even a dog that's like towed the owner down the street for five years. Because when you know how to create the beginning from home, everything that comes after that is beautiful. Uh, so today's client, they sent their dog away for two weeks, right, to a, a training place. <clears throat> and I said to them, uh, does your dog, your dog jump at the back door? And they go, yeah. And I go, that's a problem you want fixed, right? 
And I said, well, how are they going to teach the dog to stop jumping up at your back door if they're at a facility? You know, because even if the dog learns not to jump on their door, mm. it doesn't mean the dog won't jump on your door because dogs learn by association. The dog has to learn in your presence from you in regards to how do I enter this house? How do I feel when I enter this? Do I enter this house respectfully or am I demanding? So then I teach the owner to do it and it takes like two minutes and we're done. And you just taught something in two minutes that they couldn't teach in two weeks at all. Hmm. That cost you thousands of dollars. You know, if I if I could have someone pay for everything for me, I'd do my work for free. Because <laughs> you know, I, I just, it just... It, it feels like everyone that owns a dog, it's like they they should have the right to know what to do. That's what I feel. I, I feel the way it is right now, it's very unfair to them. And it's more unfair that they get taught the, right, the wrong thing to do, get charged for it, and it makes their life harder. You know, and like a, one of the videos we did, I had a client that spent $10,400 in eight months. And then at the end of that, they were told to euthanize their dog because it's not working. The dog's got a problem with his brain, right? So in about an hour and a half, the dog had no problem with his brain. And I didn't do brain surgery, hmm. you know. <laughs> so meaning there was no problem with the brain. And that was done by um, Australia's top veterinary behaviorist, hmm. the most qualified in Australia. That was who did that. I don't need to name any names. No, yeah. that's fine. Um, I feel like I've been holding myself back because there was probably a thousand rabbit holes we could have gone down there um, and we'd probably end up being on the, this call for about three hours. That's why <laughs> this needs to be like a weekly thing. Yeah. Um, but like just to kind of draw it back, I mean, the, the primary topic we wanted to cover is behavioral problems for dogs and, and you've spoken about yep. the psychology around that. If you had to yep. draw it back to kind of one big takeaway for people today... Would it be that dichotomy between um, the demanding and receiving? Is that is, is that what you think, or how would you summarize it? Massively, massively. Well, the rule is if everything's on your terms, you won't have a problem. Yeah. And terms means not talking. Because if you say something, it still allows choice. So mm. the dog chooses to do it, that's on the dog's terms. But if you lead the dog, let's say, for example, into its bed, you take away choice. But you're still leading and guiding and teaching. You're not, you're not giving a treat and going in your bed and asking the dog and giving choice. And that makes a phenomenal difference. And then when you're leading the dog in around at home, not letting the dog do whatever it wants, it's, it's more consistent than kind of like letting the dog do whatever it wants, giving the dog choice, and then trying to control the dog on leash on a walk. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the simple way of putting it would be do everything, don't say anything, Smother your dog with the calmest affection you can and just make everything on your terms. I guess without force. I guess what you're saying is it's simple in theory, but it's a, like it can be complex in application, which is why someone with you know almost 20 years' experience like yourself um, is probably yeah. very valuable to people. The application itself is, is to do is super simple. Hmm. The hard part. He's not doing everything else. So when I work with someone, the bulk of the session is more teaching them what not to do. Because yep. what to do is so simple and little and quick and clean because it needs to be simple for the dog. We don't want to overcomplicate. It's not fair to the dog. So like leading the dog in and out of the house, for example. Because some people say, well, the dog won't get out of the house when I tell the dog to get out. I say, we'll use a leash, take the dog out. They go, oh, okay. But if you do that with consistency... That's where the money maker is. Because then if you do that for a month, for example, the dog will feel if they want me out, I have to go out. I don't have choice. Mm. But that creates a calmness in the dog. It's really cool. Um, I, I've given people advice nationally, internationally, um, and just given simple instructions. And depending on what's happening with their dog, I go, okay, all I want you to do is this. Just lead the dog out, lead the dog in. Give the dog keeps a massage. Stop doing fetch. Stop talking to your dog. And I'll get a call in like three days going, my dog has completely changed. And at the beginning, I was like, really? Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> um, but if you look at their interaction, their interaction is in the opposite of what they were doing. So, of course, that's going to gonna 
force change. Yeah. yeah. Well, Nathan, um, I feel like I've got a lot of thoughts buzzing through my head at the moment. I've learned a huge amount from, from the chat with you today. But where's the best place people can go to, to find out more about you and what you're doing? Is it the website? The website, which is dogbehaviorspecialist.com.au. Um, and we're going to, we're going to be releasing videos on YouTube and stuff. And, um, hopefully we can, uh, do some more work together and, um, uh, uh, I can share your videos. We can share ours with you guys. Um, so hopefully they'll be able to see some of our stuff through you guys as well. Yeah. Perfect. Well, um, I'm sure everyone will look forward to checking out your videos. I'll share all those links when we, when we publish the episode. But thanks for coming yeah, on the cool. dog show today. On a TV show uh, called Barking Mad. Yes, I saw so the Barking clip for that. Mad. Sounds it's a cool name. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That that one was a, like a test pilot with a different mm. production company. Uh, we're heading in a very different direction, so the format will be different. But um, the main thing, like what we've talked about today, uh, is the content. So in that one you saw. There's not a lot of content. It's kind of like this, oh, that's a nice TV show. But we moved away from that because I want this to be more educational um, and entertaining, not mm. mainly entertaining with the littlest bit of education. Because I want people to be able to watch it and make change in their lives. Mm. That's my goal. Because if I can get everything out of here and share it with the public, I'll die happy. Well, that's what, yeah, that's what I'm trying to do with the podcast too. I mean, it's all about trying to make people actually, you know, help help with their dog behavior issues or whatever else is going on in their life when it comes to dogs. So, Awesome. Cool. Well, thanks again, Nathan. My pleasure, Will. Thanks for having me.